So the revocable or living trust is a little different. It's a trust you set up during your lifetime. The biggest benefit of the revocable trust is that you can skip the entire court probate process. The trust will own all of your assets while you're alive and will continue to own all your assets after your death. So there's nothing that you own personally at your death and therefore no probate assets, nothing the court has to supervise. So it's a little more work to set up than a testamentary trust because we have to create it now and we have to put everything into it now. It's kind of like making a little empty box and you say everything that's in the box follows these rules. So the testamentary trust is only there in a contingency. It says, if I die and my spouse is gone and my kids are young, then the court, please create this new trust, right? Whereas the revocable trust, we're creating it now and we're setting it up and we have to put everything into it. So we write a deed, we put your house into the trust, you update your 401k and your retirement accounts and your life insurance and make the trust the beneficiary uh, and you update your other bank accounts and so forth and make them owned by the trust. So this trust now has the rules. Initially, you start out as a trustee, whether you're single or have a spouse, you, or your, you and your spouse can be the trustees in charge of the trust. So I, we're talking about my car example at the beginning. At this point, you're still the beneficiary and the legal owner, right? You're the trustee in charge of the money and you're the beneficiary as long as you're alive. But those roles can diverge over time. If you become incapacitated, you can have your spouse or somebody else manage the money for your benefit. And if you pass away, then somebody else can be the trustee and you can have other beneficiaries. You can have kids or whoever else you like as beneficiaries, right? So again, the big benefit is you're getting out of the uh, probate. And there's no tax consequence during your life with a revocable trust. It's ignored for tax purposes. So it's as if you own everything individually still. Uh, so you still file a normal tax return uh, joint with your spouse or a single if you're single, and everything's taxed the same way. It just avoids that whole probate process and helps with the transfer. So um, you can be your own trustee. We talked about that. You can pick successor trustees. Who's going to be next? So spouse, you could have children, you could have family and friends, you could have a bank trust company, you could have an attorney. So a lot of flexibility into who's going to be in charge of the trust after you are. Uh, and we can do some specific things for the trust that are very useful. So you've got control of the property after your life. All the things you put in the testamentary trust, you can also put in the revocable trust. Kid gets the money when they turn 25 or finishes college or whatever rules you like, right? In addition to that, we can have see-through provisions that allow a retirement account to be inherited on behalf of the kids. So the, the retirement account goes to the trust. The trust then holds on to it for the life of the kids, and it can continue to grow on a tax-free or tax-deferred basis. And your retirement account that was $500,000 grows to $2 million over the kid's lifetime. We can put in spend-through provisions. So if you've got a beneficiary like Timmy who should never have their money, then we can make sure that they don't get into trouble with it. If you have any special needs beneficiaries, you've got uh, an older parent who is in a nursing home or you've got a kid that's got a disability of some sort, we can put in special rules to make sure that they get their maximum government benefits, uh, nursing home expenses or social security, and the trust supplements that, rather than having the money in the trust disqualify them from those benefits. Whether you have a special needs beneficiary or not, I always put that language in my documents as a contingency, because you never know if somebody's gonna get into an accident or, or need that kind of thing in the future. We talked about underage beneficiaries putting in rules for their education, living expenses, and so forth. The other interesting thing, if you've got multiple kids, is how do you manage the money when you, when you have multiple kids? So let's say, in my case, i got kids that are six years apart. So the oldest could be done with college, and the youngest could still be in high school. So if I died at that time, the youngest is going to need more money than the oldest. And if I said, just split into four equal shares on my death, then the youngest one's going to get shortchanged a little bit, because I've already paid for college for the oldest one. And so... Uh, I can say instead, I want the money to be pooled for all the kids, and the trustee can spend disproportionately, just like I as a parent would do, until the youngest kid is 22 years old or finishes college or whatever rule you'd like, so that, uh, again, the trustee can figure out what's the best place to spend the money, and then once the youngest one gets to be an old enough, you split in the shares for the beneficiaries. So you got a couple decisions to make in that respect. You can put in specific gifts to tangible property or individuals or organizations, just like you can do in a will. Um, you can put in charitable gifts. You can put in care for, the, for pets. So my partner, Eric, his wife has two horses, right? We've had a few other clients with horses. Horses live a long time, and they're almost as expensive as kids, maybe more so, right? Uh, and so if you've got pets, uh, you can decide if you want to have a specific amount of money or who gets the pet or setting some money aside uh, to take care of them. Um, and so we talk about the rule against perpetuities. You can, the maximum amount of time you can have for the trust is the life in being plus 21 years. So if you've got little kids, it's basically their life plus 21 years into the grandkids' lives. So when do you use a revocable trust? If you have more than a couple hundred thousand dollars in assets, 
it's cheaper to set up the revocable trust than it is to go through probate. Now the trade-off there is if you're in your 30s or, or 40s and you say, oh, I'm, the likelihood of me dying anytime soon is pretty small, and the likelihood of me and my spouse dying anytime soon is even smaller. So I'm going to wait and I'll do the revocable trust later when I get older. Um, even though it's you know cost-benefit thing, it's money now versus money later, right? Uh, if you have real estate in multiple states, a trust is a big benefit. So let's say you have a piece of property here in Virginia, and you still have that house from when you lived in New Mexico, right? Then you might say, okay, great, I, I've got the trust set up, and everything's in that trust, and we've avoided probate in both New Mexico and in Virginia, because you go through probate in the state where you lived at the time of your death, and in any other state where you have real estate, because that state has jurisdiction over the real estate. So I had one family that had been in the military and they'd been stationed several places, and they had a rental property in New Mexico, and they had one in Colorado, and they had one in Florida, and they had the condo here in Virginia. I said, you guys should be going through probate in a lot of places. The trust can solve all that at once, right? It's a lot less hassle for your beneficiaries to have the trust because you've kind of done a lot of the work for them in advance. Uh, and uh, there's some tax advantages, retirement accounts, and things like that. Here's the mistakes that I see people when they set up a trust. You know, they don't put their money into the trust. I've got this nice empty box. I forgot to put everything into it. It really hasn't done me any good. Uh, or I don't do it correctly. I've got some things in there and, and other things not. Or I put things in prematurely and I lose a tax benefit. For a retirement account, for example, you want your surviving spouse to be the first beneficiary and you want the trust to be the contingent beneficiary because there's different rules for inheriting a retirement account if you're a spouse than if you're somebody else. Right? Uh, the other thing I see is that trusts don't have good tax provisions in them, and so money's going into the trust, but the trust has to cash out all the retirement accounts and doesn't get to have that stretch out period. So that gets very intricate in terms of the IRS rules. Uh, and creditor protection. This is a very important thing, and there was a Supreme Court case just last year. So with a retirement account, if you have a 401k uh, or an IRA, and you go bankrupt while you're, uh, you're an adult and it's your account, right? You still get to keep your retirement account. It's, as long as it was an employer-sponsored account, you can go bankrupt and you still get to keep your retirement account. So everybody assumed, well, if I inherited mom's retirement account, then it's still protected from my creditors, right? And the Supreme Court last year ruled, no, an uh, inherited retirement account is really not like a retirement account because you don't get to keep it until you turn retirement age. You have to start cashing out as you go along. And therefore, if you inherit a retirement account, and somebody sues you, they can take that as, along with all your other assets. So if you go bankrupt, you can, they, all, all of it disappears. However, if you set up a trust and all of your retirement accounts go into the trust for your kids, for example, then as long as the money stays in the trust and the, the, the trust is, has the title of the asset, even if the kid has access to it as a trustee, it's protected from their creditors. So a big benefit to have creditor protection. 